Welcome to the Think Podcast with Joel Sedeckes. I'm Joel Sedeckes, and this is the show that tackles impossible questions from a biblical perspective to help you explain, share, and defend the Christian message. Now, some of you may have seen on social media this week that I posted the new lineup of episodes. We're going to have a different episode, a different kind of episode every day of the week. So over the next two weeks, we're going to be ramping up to the new format. And today, since it's Tuesday, today is the day that we do two for Tuesday. No, Tuesday twofers is what we're calling it. And that is where you get not one, but two thinkers for the price of one. Of course, that price is still free. We're not charging for this. But if you do want to support the work that we're doing with the Think Institute and the Think Podcast, simply go to thethink.institute. You can find out how to get involved as a prayer and financial partner with my family and the work that we are doing. So check that out. And I've got an impossible question for you today. And that is this, how is homeschooling going? Yes, that's right. Thanks to coronavirus, we are all homeschoolers now. When Elisa and I started homeschooling back in February, we actually found homeschooling to be less stressful than sending our kids to school every day. And that's not because we were experts, but it was because we had amazing support from a community of other families through our homeschool cooperative. Now, maybe you didn't want to homeschool, but here you are. And now you've got this incredible opportunity to take ownership of your kids' education and really form in them a robust biblical perspective on the world. This is the time to decide that you're going to make the most of your time home with your children. And my guest today is going to help us all learn how to do that, even if your kids are currently enrolled in public school and doing remote learning or e-learning. So Christine Parker is the head of rhetoric at Veritas Academy. She's going to correct me if I got her title wrong. And that is a Christ-centered classical homeschool community in Chicago. So, Christine, welcome to the Think Podcast. How's it going? Hey there, Joel. How you doing? Hey, doing great. So, Christine, did I get your title right? What, what well, are I'm you? one of the directors of Veritas Academy, and so I direct the upper level. So that's logic and rhetoric, So, which kind of equates to junior high, high school. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. And, you know, we're both Chicagoans, and I always say that despite all the issues with Chicago, this is still the best city in the world, this side of the New Jerusalem. So what are you most looking forward to uh, getting out and doing in the city once the lockdown is lifted? We are hoping still to go on a road trip. So the plan is that we're going to go hit some national parks um, out west. So hopefully we'll do that and then come back in just bike ride as a family. Awesome. Biking. You guys are all into biking? We are. Very cool. And uh, where do you guys go? We went over to um, that. Th- there's a forest preserve that's just just outside the city where they, they have a, a supposedly magical water pump. And the name of it is escaping me right now, but it's just outside the city. Where do you guys like to go bike riding? So on a regular basis, we go up that, um, the bike trail kind of up north. Now that it, it hits through, we hit it started at Gompers and go straight north as far as we can go. We started the Skokie Lagoon sometimes and kind of bike around there up to the botanical and go in that back door so we can bike around the botanical gardens. And sometimes if we're really ambitious, we go all the way out to St. Charles and bike along the St. Charles River. Wow. Which is just gorgeous. My five-year-old is uh, still having a hard time keeping up, so we haven't quite done one of those ambitious trips in a while. Okay. Oh, very, very cool. So tell us about Veritas Academy and your responsibilities there. Okay. So Veritas started, we're only probably about eight years, seven years old. And um, it started after I started homeschooling. Basically, a group of us got together and said, we are extroverts. And if we are going to do this journey of homeschooling, we cannot possibly do it at home on our own. So we wanted to get a group of like-minded people together and kind of divide out the work and share among each other. So our foundational principles, kind of as you mentioned before, is um, we were Christian. So we're Christ-centered in our focus. That means everything, like the teachers who teach there are teaching from a Christian biblical worldview. The curriculum that we use is from a biblical worldview. 
It doesn't mean that we shy away from really hard topics. We read excellent literature, um, really hard books for the kids to read, um, delving into tough topics, but we do it all centered into like a Christ, Christ framework. Um, and the other side of it is classical. So when you heard the term, like most people out there would say, what in the world is a director of rhetoric? A director of rhetoric is basically the three levels of the trivium under classical education, going way back to the days of like Socrates and Plato, they divided education into three levels. Grammar is the level where they're absorbing information. Logic is the level is where they're making connections. And rhetoric is the level where they're beginning to be able to articulate their positions on all these connections. So that's who we are. We've been around, as I said, for about seven years, and we have about 100 students right now. And what makes Veritas distinct as an organization? Um, you know, there's a lot of things that make it distinct. So I would say one of the things is that every single person who is teaching there is a mom who has their children involved in the community. And what's different is you think of a, a community like that. We don't all have education backgrounds. We did not all grow up thinking someday I'm going to be a teacher and someday I'm going to educate my kids. Um, but we do love our kids and we are um, following the classical method. We are learning alongside them and just making sure we're kind of just one step ahead of them in the teaching journey. So, and I think another thing that's really dif different about Veritas is we foster critical thinking. So that is one of the key elements of a classical education is that we don't wanna just teach the kids to be able to do a skill. We wanna teach them to be able to think about life issues and that can apply to any career they decide to do. All right, and we've talked about classical education a few times on this show. I am a major proponent of it. Uh, thrilled that my own kids are now getting a classical education. But for those who really aren't familiar with that term, uh, didn't grow up with a classical education, you mentioned the trivium, you mentioned being able to think critically. Could you just give us sort of like the, the you know, one minute version intro into what is a classical education? How is it different from what we all grew up with? Oh man, so the one minute version. Um, I would say the key elements about a classical ed education that are different from modern education. So they seek to uh, reach the child at the level that they're at. And so when they divide it into three levels, the grammar, the logic, and the trivium, uh, and, and the rhetoric level, they're really kind of looking at how is a child thinking and processing information? So we all know like our little kids at the grammar stage, they're just sponges. They're just absorbing facts and parroting those facts back to us, whether it's like lyrics they're hearing on the radio or memes or you know any other you know songs that they hear, they're just parroting those back to us. So at, in the classical level, we say, take advantage of that and teach them a lot of you know, facts and information. So they're learning facts about history and they're learning facts about science and they're learning facts about um, you know, the, the historical timeline and Christianity and biblical worldview and memorizing scripture. And then they're starting to make connections with those facts. Like, how does that fit into a picture overall? Um, and then once they get to the logic level, then they've got their fact basis. And that's when, if you think about your logic level as like your junior higher, that's when they're starting to say, but why? Why should I do that? They're starting to push back a little. They're coming into their own skin. That's totally natural. And that stage, we don't want to just teach them to memorize facts. We want to teach them how to make connections. So a, a typical question in that level might be, okay, so we know that Germany was um, on the other side of the US in World War I and in World War II. What could have happened differently to make Germany um, switch positions so they maybe weren't, weren't the instigators, the antagonists in World War II? How could we have treated them as a country differently? They know the fact background. They wanna know how did we get to the position we were? And then at the rhetoric level, they're gonna say, if we would have done this differently, then Germany would not have ended up, Hitler wouldn't have been born, he wouldn't have had the seeds for the, the authority that he had. So it's taking a position then and being able to articulate that position for these three reasons. Other people may say this, this is why that's wrong. So it's kind of the levels. Um, the other aspect of classical education is really looking at education holistically. So we're not gonna just teach um, a point in time, like it is fantastic to get a, a Black History Month, but we want to get Black History Month in the context of why are we studying Black History Month? What happened in the past to bring slavery over here to the United States? What were some of the injustices that were here? Um, what is the historical background be behind that, you know, with slavery in general? 
So it's not just taking something and looking at a point in time, it's looking at how it fits into the whole picture. So that's another aspect of classical education. All right. And so we're going to unpack this a little bit more, but obviously we're not just talking about classical education or even primarily classical education today, but right. really homeschooling. So what, what, before we really unpack what's all involved and, and how to win at homeschooling, you know, what the secret is to homeschooling, what is one important thing parents need to understand about homeschooling? What, if there's one thing that they walk away from today after this conversation, what do you want that one thing to really be? One thing. So I would say no matter where you are in school, whether you're in private school or public school or you're homeschooling right now, you're in charge of your kid's education. It's just who, who it is that happens to be in um, filling out those steps or, or completing those steps, but you're directing your kid's education. So in homeschooling, you actually have just a little bit more control over that education. You can customize it to where your kids are. You can tailor it to their strengths and abilities. You can slow it down when you need to slow it down. Um, and you're not, so this is, I'm cheating. This is not one, this is not one thing. I'm giving you two. So you're in charge. That's all right. That's all right. And you're not alone. So you don't have to think like, okay, I have to go write a curriculum up and do this. There are so many great resources out there. The same curriculum that, you know, public school, private school, you, you can buy these curriculum and you can use them at home and then surround yourself with people that want to do life alongside of you. So you're not alone. Oh, that's, that's really great. And you mentioned your own background a little bit, but let's talk about your story. What is your background, Christine? How did you end up homeschooling? Schooling, was this always something that your husband and you wanted to do? How did you get here? That's actually a funny story. So what I would say is my story, what, what my story is not. I did not dream of having a ton of children and um, raising my children and homeschooling my children and having a long skirt and gym shoes and a bonnet in my head. That was not, that was my dream. Um, my dream was actually more, I wanted to have an amazing marriage. I wanted to glorify Christ in whatever I did. And I wanted to have a um, successful and academically intellectually challenging career. And what that looked like for me was I went to school um, undergrad on a full ride for pre-med. So I was going to be a doctor because I was good at math and science. Somewhere in the, along the line, I realized I didn't love it. So I switched to pre-law and I went down the route of getting my JD to practice law. And then I added on an MBA for good measure to understand what the business world was in the context of law. So I, um, I was actually at one of the largest law firms in Chicago. And then I got um, the, I had the opportunity to move in-house with a fortune 100 company. I was in their law departments. And um, one of the moments where we started to think about homeschooling was my, my husband and I both had really successful jobs. We had a full-time nanny helping us out on the home front. Um, and we, I was up for a promotion to go to the to an executive role at this Fortune 100 company, and they flew me out to New York. I won't say where because then I'll give away my company. So they flew me out to New York. I met the CEO of this Fortune 100 company, the head of the law department, and I realized then that I was losing time with my kids. Like every step that I took that was um, rising me up the corporate ladder was taking time away from my kids and my family. And um, we were also at the same time, we were at a spot where it was just, we were super invested in the public schools because our perspective was if you take the light out of the public schools and then it'll just be darkness. And so my husband and I were on the LSC and the PTA and I formed a Friends of Belding organization to be on the local um, school. Um, and LSC we, is local school council. Just yes, yes. Um, so we were super involved there, and it was right around the time of the teacher strike, the last teacher strike, not this recent one, but the one before in 2012, I think it was. Um, and we just kind of looked at where our kids were academically. Um, my daughter was in a school where she was not getting the academic challenge she needed. Um, the teacher just didn't have the time or the resources to be able to meet her needs and, and basically said she had to focus on the kids who needed to be brought up a level. And my son was in kindergarten in a class of 37 students, one teacher, no aid, 
and a third of the kids didn't speak English as their first language. So he wasn't learning to read. You know, he wasn't learning the basic skills. And so we said, okay, we want more time with our kids. Um, what does that look like? And um, we need to be able to um, reinforce their academic needs in a different way because they're not having it met. So our turning point was, so this teacher strike happens. I had this opportunity for promotion. Um, we did the whole jumping through the hoops of the CPS tests. And my daughter landed in our dream public school and my son didn't. And so we were about to enter that crazy phase of sending our kids to multiple different schools while I had this dream career and we, we were losing control. And so we basically kind of said, I, instead of taking the promotion, I turned the promotion down and I asked for a sabbatical and I took a year to say, we're just going to try to figure this education thing out for a year. So I said I was going to homeschool for one year to stop gap until I could figure out what private school we were going to put our kids in. So that was my journey to homeschooling was it was going to be a one year stop gap. And um, because I handle things. So when, when people think about homeschooling, I think about I think some of the things people think about are I have to be really creative and I have to have a ton of patience. And oh my goodness, like if that is what homeschooling is, then I fail because I am not creative and I every single day have to ask for forgiveness of my kids and I have to start in the word every day, but I am organized. And so I went down the path of researching. So what does homeschool look like? What are the different ways of homeschooling? And that's how I came to set up Veritas is we needed to have a, if I was going to do this, I wanted to do it in a community of like-minded people. And do you find that uh, some of the other directors, the other leaders, parents, moms who are involved, do they, do they compliment you in the sense, are, are they more creative? Do they have some of those skills that you don't have or, or is it a bunch of Christine's? <laughs> um, thankfully it's not a bunch of Christine's cause that would not be fun. Um, it is awesome. I, I feel like homeschooling has been one of those moments where I say it all the time to the people in community and they're probably tired of me saying it, but for the first time in my life, I truly understand what it means to be the body of Christ. Like God didn't make mm. us all to be, a, you know, an elbow or a, a hand or a foot, you know, he didn't make us all that way. And so there's not one of us in the community that has the exact same set of skills. So maybe my job is to set the structural framework for it. And to think, you know, on the big picture of curriculum and that sort of thing. But when I hand these lesson plans over to the teachers, the things that they do with them, they just wouldn't even enter my mind. They're just, they're, they're creative. They're amazing. They think about things from different levels. And so every single one of these moms in the community has the exact set of skills and gifts that God knew we needed. And every, every time we have a new need that comes up, it is, again, it's one of those exercises in prayer. Like we pray very specifically for what the need is and God brings like exactly what we need. So it's been amazing that way. Now you said something earlier. You said that parents own their kids' education, even if it's others who are filling out those intermediate steps, getting them yep. from, you know, between, between A and Z, there's all these different steps they have to get there. Now, uh, what would you say to parents, maybe even Christian parents who say, you know, Christine, that, that all sounds well and good in, in theory, but I don't own my kids' education. I'm not an educator. Uh, you wouldn't want me owning my kids' education. That's what the schools are for. That's why we pay real estate taxes. This is, uh, you know, this is, this is why, um, this is why we have a public school system. So, so don't put that on me. Don't, don't say I own my kids education. That's too daunting. That's too, um, it's just not realistic. You know, what do you say to a parent who says something like that? So I would say what um, the verses that hit me in this process of trying to figure out what we were going to do with our kids education. These are, these are two verses that kind of hit me and humble it humbled me. Um, so Proverbs 22, six, says, uh, train up your child in the way that you should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from that way. And so what we were finding in our public school education setting, and we've done, we've done all three, we've done public school, we've done private school, and we've done homeschool now. So we have been in all three arenas, but when we were finding in the other school setting is that someone else had more time with my children. And so they had more time to train them up. And so 
you know, everyone knows that when a child, you know, when a person is following an apprenticeship, what's, what's the goal of an apprenticeship? To become like their master. And so if their master is someone that has a worldview view or belief system that um, is different than your worldview or your belief system, then they are going to become more and more like that other worldview and belief system. And so my master is Jesus. And so certainly I'm not always modeling that, um, but my goal is seeking after that. And so if, if my goal is, is um, modeling after that, then what I want to do is train up my children that way. Um, and so the other verse that hit me was Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 9, so a set of verses. Um, that is these commandments I give to you today that they should be on your hearts press them on your children talk about them when you sit down when you stand up when you walk along the road when you lie down when you get up so we're basically commanded to be talking about this all the time and so that doesn't say uh, you know I'm not saying that to say homeschooling is the only way you can absolutely train up your child in the way that they should go and you can absolutely talk about about these things um, in all times during the day it's just, that what we found was our time with our kids was like this. They would, they would be gone all day long. We would get home from work. They would still have a pile of homework to do, even in second, third grade, you know, when we were making these decisions, they still had a pile of homework to do. By the time we sat down with them, they were crabby because they'd been forced to sit all day long. And they'd been told what to do, when to raise their hand, when to stand in line, when to queue up. Um, they had this pile of homework. And so our time with them was not time that we had time to focus on training them up in the way they should go. We had to be task oriented and get the things done that needed to be done. So when I say that, that's my starting point is I just, I can't say that I have the answer. I just kind of went to scripture and that was what, what God was laying on my heart was that there were these two scriptural mandates. Um, and then I think the other part of your question, Joel is, but, but I'm not qualified. Right. And I would say to a parent that says that they're not qualified, who knows your child better than you, right? I mean, you know how they learn, you know their quirks, you know how they how they think and how they don't think, you know what, you know, what makes them excited, what makes them bored, you know, everything about your child so much more than a teacher could because they've got a class of, you know, in my case, 37 kids, right? Um, with my son, 37 kids. So how could how could they possibly get to know intimately every child? So you don't have the teaching the formal teaching skills but ingrained in all of us like what do you do from the day one your child comes home from the hospital you start teaching them you teach them how to speak you teach them how to walk you teach them how to read you teach them how to do a quiet time you teach them how to go to church you teach them how to sit still you know like all those things but you're teaching them from day one i think that um the label of teacher has just you know gotten a little bit hijacked it doesn't have to be someone who's just trained to be a teacher We've been teaching our children from day one. All right. Now, I know the folks who are going to be watching this, listening to this, they they want some practical advice. Maybe they're not ready to jump in to homeschooling right now. Okay. But their kids are at home. They're doing remote learning. And, um, and I've heard a little bit about um, – I've got some friends who are teachers. I've got some – some friends who have their kids in CPS, Chicago Public Schools, um, some friends outside of the city of Chicago. And I understand that different school districts are handling the situation a little differently. Uh, one of the things I've heard is that there are some teachers um, who are actually requiring parents to be out of the room, out totally disconnected from the process of their kids' education during this remote learning time. And we could go back and forth on whether or not that's a good idea. Um, those who know me probably can anticipate my reaction to that. Uh, it's going to be, that's a big no for me. But um, but what about those parents? Their kids are in the, in the schools. They're doing remote learning, but they have all this extra time because extracurriculars and things like that are canceled. How can they maximize the time that they have with their kids, even while doing this remote learning um, situation, what are some tips and tools? What's the secret to making the most out of that time, Christine? Okay, so I would say let's start with let's start with just the practical part of it. The very first thing is I found when um, my kids were in the public school system because the teachers were setting all of the schedules. 
we were doing more of a just responding. So the teachers would send home an assignment and we'd respond to that assignment. So I didn't have like the big picture because I didn't need the big picture, but you can have the big picture. So my very first thing that I would say is set a space and get organized. That's your very first thing that you want to do. So what does that look like? Get all of those communications that teachers have sent home since the beginning of the year. Get the assignment calendar for the year. Get connected to your kids' emails because a lot of times the teachers are just emailing your kids directly. Um, link up to those emails <clears throat> so you know what's exactly going on and just get a big picture. It, just, it takes a, you know, a couple hours, but get organized. Um, the second part of get organized is set up a space. So each one of your kids are going to need just a space that they know that they can go to where their stuff is. So at a school, we think about that as like our desk, right? The kids have their desk and they put their books in their desk and they know where that is. So at home, we don't have desks. We don't need desks. What you do need is a bookshelf or a cubby hole or a bin. So get a space where they put all of their books together in one place. Their devices that they need, their um, curriculum, like their assignments for the, the remainder of the year, everything that they need in one area. So that's kind of the, um, the, the what and the where. Get your arms around the what are they studying and like where is the stuff that they're going to need. Um, the next thing I would say is set a routine, but be flexible about that routine. So your kids need some sort of a structure to the day. And I'm just going to be totally honest. I am not a morning person. So my routine starts at nine. None of this like seven in the morning kind of stuff. So I get up beforehand. I do my quiet time. And then we start our school at nine. But I'm really, really, um, we really try to stick to that starting at nine. So set a routine. And then you kind of have a starting point and your, your kids kind of know, you know, what, what that looks like in the day. Um, they need, uh, the other thing that I would say is, to the, again, the extent that you have control over subjects, do the hardest subjects first in the day. Like that's when their brain is the freshest. So tackle whatever their hard subject is, whether that's math for some of them or whether it's science or for some of them that maybe it's literature or writing. Do that um, hard subject first in the day and then have like a carrot. So you're going to take a break then and you're going to do something fun. You're going to play a game together. You're going to read a book together. You're going to go for a walk together. Just give their, their brains a chance to just take a break. And then you can go and do like the easier subjects in the afternoon, the ones that whatever that the easier subjects are for your particular kids. Um, so you know, have that be the afternoon. Um, the, the next thing that I would say is you're going to have time on your hands. Take back that time. So a lot of time, um, I think when we were kind of talking ahead of the, this call, Joel, a lot of time that you find in school is, is really learning to do school. You know, you're spending a lot of time like, okay, I need, I need to raise my hand for questions and I need to queue up in line and oh, this person's being, you know, disrespectful. So we need to repeat the lesson. So don't worry if your kids get done like their entire school day in three to four hours, because they really can get done their entire amount of work in that period of time without all those interruptions. So then that means what? That means you've got another pool of time to do things in. What does that look like? So that time, what I would say is resist the urge to fill it back up again with a whole lot of online instructions. I know there's a whole lot of resources going out here now from like, you know, Khan Academy and online classes and all that that say, okay, now that you've got time at home, dial into this and do this other program. Your kids are, you know, they're getting enough of their instructional time in their, you know, regular school day right now. Your, your teachers have set that up for them. Take back some of that time and like snuggle with them and read a really great book. You know, a book, uh, reading a book, a read aloud, our read aloud time is a time where, you know, all of my kids from age five to age 15, yes, my teenager still likes to sit next to me um, and do read aloud time. And we just choose really great books that sometimes they're ones that have to do with the time period in history they're studying. Sometimes they're just really well-written books. And we just sit and like, and yeah, we, I'll use the word snuggle. We snuggle together. We just have you know time next to each other. And that is that relational bonding time is one of the most important things in establishing your relationship with your kids. So um, in that extra time, read together, go outside together and character building moments are learning time. 
You know, absolutely. When you have something in the middle of the day where you're, you know, all of a sudden you're going to start realizing some of these quirks that your kids have and they come out and, you know, before you just didn't have time to address them. Character building is learning time. Like what are we doing as teachers, if not pouring into our kids and molding their character? Um, so that's the, the next thing I would say is, you know, don't fill it up with e-learning. Um, limit screen time. Okay. Most important thing is how do you start your day? You got to start your day in the word, like no matter what. So this is one thing that I, I didn't do up until I started homeschooling and even past homeschooling. I didn't, I didn't really do regularly until the last couple of years. So what I find is if I get up in the morning and the first thing I'm reading is what the news has to say about coronavirus, then my day is processed through that lens of, you know, worry and insecurity. And if I start my day with reading my email about all the things I have to do for my work, then my day is processed through that lens of my to-do list. But if I start my day in Word, then I find that th that is the framework for you know, getting my kids on board. And that, and that means for your kids too, like set up a bin for them of their morning time, do Bible time together as a family, have them teach them how to journal, teach them how to you know, journal their prayers, teach them how to get in the Word, do devotions together, sing together, dance together, like start your day that way. And that will overcome so many more of the humps of the day. You know, one of the things that Alisa and I were surprised to find when we started homeschooling, Christine, is that it's actually less stressful. We're we're less stressed out by our kids' education now than yeah. when we were sending them out of the house for school. And that completely caught us by surprise. And I think part of it is, like you said, when, when your child is out of the house and um, we, we noticed this, especially with, with one of our kids, where um, they're outside the home and they are working so hard to follow instructions and do school. And look, if you're in school, you have to learn how to sit still, how to raise yeah. your hand when you want to speak. These are necessary behaviors. But at home, it's not that we don't want our kids to behave. Obviously we do, but we can spend more time on actually discipling them in the way it's not just behavior modification, but it's virtue. We're training mm -hmm. them not, not only to be nice, but to be kind, you know, not only to sit still, but to respect. And, and what we found is that our kids, when they get frustrated, we can take that time and, and practice biblical discipline, pray with them, preach the gospel to them. And it's had such a restorative effect on our kids. Being with our kids has made being with our kids more enjoyable. Whereas before we only had the, you know, the margins of, of their day and it was too much to try to cram all that in, all, all the training we wanted to do. And the, I, did you notice that when you started homeschooling, did you find it to be less stressful or are we the weird ones here? <laughs> well, you're weird, Joe. But well, I know that. I know that. <laughs> um, so I would say, so for the parents who are doing it right now, what I would say is the first couple of weeks, it's going to be stressful. You know, I mean, the reality is, you know, at the yes. very beginning when you're trying to get into it. And as of right now, um, I'm going to just make a distinction. So what you've had to do, like the listeners out there who have kids in full-time school outside of, you're doing crisis schooling right now. And that's, you know, that's, that's different. Give yourself grace. And if you're feeling like, oh my goodness, this isn't, you know, all wonderful roses all the time. Like that's a little bit different because you are having to react to someone else's agenda and their assignments and all that. Um, but I have heard from a lot of my friends, and this was our personal experience, that once we got past that, like the first couple of weeks of trying to, you know, orient, so it's like orienting for a new job, right? You're in a new job, you're trying to figure out all the rules, the, you know, the rules, how does this go, where works best. But after that, we, we had moments that at first were like catching us by surprise. Like I, I learned that I liked my kids. And I know that sounds really bad, but our relationship the year before that was not that, you know, not that I didn't like them, but they, they had aspects of their personality that I just wasn't seeing. And I was so on task all the time because we had to always get something done. And so now we can just, you know, if we have to, we can stop and address things as they come up instead of reactionary parenting, which is what I had to do before because I had this much time, I can proactively parent. And so I think that's the difference is we're finding we have, we have more time with them. We have more, um, we have more ability to, 
to, to build into their character. We have more ability to, to structure the things that they want to do, you know, take advantage of that. And I think that probably goes to, you know, your next thought about like homeschool going forward, but um, absolutely. We've, we've enjoyed our time with our kids. Well, yeah. And let's talk about that because, you know, some of the information that, uh, that we're getting from Governor Pritzker, the governor of Illinois, Mayor Lori Lightfoot here in Chicago, some of it's coming in in bits and pieces. Some of it's hearsay. Um, it's it's hard to know exactly what the plan moving forward is going to be for Illinois and for Chicago. And I know a lot of other folks in other states and cities are dealing with a lot of ambiguity about the future with regard to their kids' education. But some of the talk out there is that schools may not even open in the fall, which, you know, I think for a lot of people that may be the straw that breaks the camel's back and they might say, well, what are my other options then? Because, um, you know, this e-learning thing, Christine, I thought what you said was was so good, so helpful. It is crisis schooling right now, but, but a cri- we can, our, um, we're equipped to be able to deal with crisis for a short period of time. But if you're constantly perpetually in crisis mode that that's unhealthy long term and so as parents are thinking about how to get out of crisis mode should homeschool i know how you're going to answer this it's a very leading question should homeschooling be a viable option and i know your answer is yes so will you will you now please make a preliminary case for us um and i and you're going to need to use some of these classical rhetorical skills here christine um <laughs> how how should parents begin to think about, about about homeschooling as a viable option? So I would start to say the very first thing you want to do is just start to understand like what is what could homeschool look like for you? Um, the first thing I did personally, and this is the way I approach things, is I called up everyone I knew that was homeschooling and I, I asked them for who they knew that was homeschooling. So just figure out like what is it? Because I think a lot of people have an idea of what homeschooling is. I certainly did. I thought that I had to fit a very certain mold to homeschool. Um, I thought that I had to be an introvert that wanted to stay at home at all times with my my children and put them in a bubble that they they, they couldn't get out of. Um, and that is not what homeschooling has turned out to be at all. So I would say the think about homeschooling like this: homeschooling is a way for you to increase your time together as a family your quality time together as a family. We have the best portions of our kids' day that we get to enjoy together. Um, and that is that has been the blessing of homeschooling. Um, homeschooling is a, is a way to think about your hands-on discipling your children. Um, I am able to, when I think about the academic side of homeschooling, my kids are at all different, you know, it's a, it's a wide spectrum. I, I have five kids now, so so much to that, I didn't wanna have a large family thing. God had other plans. Um, but I have five kids, two biological, three adopted. Um, Every single one of them is completely different. And that's the way they're supposed to be. And so there's no one size fits all approach to education. And I think that's the big difference in public school. Like they have to have a one size fits all because they're in a classroom. And so they can't have, they can't have 37 different approaches. They can tailor it a little bit and adjust a little bit. But even within that, your child may be really amazing at math but really struggle with writing. And so that doesn't mean that they're an ungifted person. God has gifted every single child and he's just gifted them in different ways. So maybe they need to accelerate in math then. And maybe you just need to spend some time and dwell in in writing and, you know, help them in that area, right? So so play to their strengths instead of, I, I feel like a lot of times when we were in school, we were more in reacting to their weaknesses those were the letter grades that we were seeing that needed to be brought up. But if you play to their strengths, then they have a joy of learning. And then their weaknesses just naturally get brought up because they view education differently. And I think that's, that's you know, the next point that I would say is like, when you're homeschooling, you can teach your kids to love to learn. So one example for me is, so I did like learning, but one subject I hated was history. History to me was memorizing names and dates and places. And I could do that. I could do that and I can memorize them and I could get literally a hundred percent on the test and promptly the next day or the next hour, it was gone. Not one bit of it was, was something that I remembered. And so I remember going home and saying, why do we need to know this? What's the point of this? And 
history is the subject now as a homeschool teacher that I love the most. And that's because I feel like we've gotten to, you know, get into the the whys of history. You know, why did these things happen? What lessons can we learn as Christians from them? We've gotten to go out and experience the places. We've read books about history, not just history books, but actual, you know, books about the time frame and people taking place there. So I've had a love for learning. So when I go back to my initial career goals, remember I said my goal was to be academically challenged. I'm more academically challenged now as a mom and a teacher than I was as a lawyer, because I really am feeling like I'm almost like reclaiming my lost education. Um, So that's another thing uh, about homeschooling is that I feel like that's an area where you know, you get a chance to, to love to learn again yourself and you're learning right alongside them. Um, and the other thing I would say about homeschooling is the flexibility. So for us, one of the key um, areas was um, my husband travels a lot for work. And that means when his travel season is there, he's gone, you know, like 100% of the time from July to September, he's gone Monday through Friday. Um, during the other times he may travel you know, days at a time. And so what we could do then is we could say, let's road school for a while and go with him on the road. Or when he's home, let's take those days off and let's just be with him. So it may be, you know, you may have have that child who's like the next Olympic athlete or the next, you know, uh, musician. You can have more flexibility in your schedule that way with homeschooling. Um, But you may also just have a child that has a passion for um, a ministry area. And so that's that's kind of one er- one thing that we found in in our kids is that Jesus's disciples were all teenagers, right? They were. This is the time and in, in place where you know modern society, when our kids are entering high school, that's the time when we're thinking, oh my goodness, I just have to get through these high school years. This is going to be really tough. But the high school years are actually the years where He's built this passion into our children, and they can finally, you know, if if we've trained them up. They've got a basis. They can articulate their beliefs and now they can start to act on them. And so we found that homeschooling has been a chance for us to let our kids, you know, run a ministry. My daughter is running a a ministry at our church. She's uh, mentoring other children. She's discipling other children. She's on a leadership team. Um, My son, the same way he's building into, uh, you know, we're building into his leadership skills. And that's something we just don't have time for outside of it. So homeschooling is flexibility. Well, and I can I can definitely vouch um, for the uh, for your own for your kids as a product of this process. Um, n- never mind, uh, never mind, uh, Lauren, who's leading in so many ways at church. But um, you know, Joshua uh, to this day, Lucas counts Joshua. Lucas, our five year old, he says that Josh is one of his best friends. Josh and uh, and uh, Josh's friend Andre are my thirteen year old. Yes, and Andre who's right. also homeschooling with him. Yes, yes, and that just goes to show how excellent <laughs> Josh is. You know how he makes Lucas feel. Lucas, this little five year old, he could That's very awesome. easily just say, "Hey, you know, get out of here, kid." But he's so friendly to him, so respectful. It's just uh, so. So that's um, so we've been the beneficiaries of that process as well. Um, Christine, in the in the time we have left. I want to push back a little bit because yep. there's there's two areas of pushback that I anticipate people are going to have when they when they hear this. The first one is is lack of opportunity. The second one is going to be let's say lack of quality. So um, let's let's start here. What do you say to and and maybe there is no good answer to this, but what do you say to the single mom who has to work outside the home? And can't afford public school. Can't, or, sorry, can't afford private school. Can't afford a nanny. Can't afford an in-home tutor. Public schooling seems to really be the only viable option. What do you What do you say to someone? Or both parents are working outside the home, and they just don't have the opportunity to homeschool. Is there Is there a good answer for someone in that situation? Absolutely. So I will say. You're going to get creative. So when we think about school, what do we think about? We think about kids lining up and getting on a bus and going to school, and they're there between the hours of eight and three. Yeah. Right? But but who made that school? 
Like that, that school, like as of what, the 1950s and beyond? Before that, school was a one-room schoolhouse that they went to when it wasn't farm season or it was, you know, being apprenticed to someone else. So those hours that you're schooling your kids, it's not about the number of hours or having it, you know, your set schedule may not look like nine to three. It may look like you and your husband, if you're a dual income family, you're tag teaming. So he teaches some of the subjects and you teach some of the subjects and you teach around your schedules. You may sometimes be schooling in the evening. So I've got one of our co-directors at Veritas, actually. She and her husband, she works a full-time job and she directs Veritas and she teaches her her kids. Um, And so how does she do it? Her husband is a firefighter. And so when he has some time that is, um, you know, on his rotations, he's got some downtime. He loves history and he tackles history with the kids. So that's his subject. And then when she's working her schedule, she works it so that she may start earlier in the morning and she does school with the kids in the afternoon or the evenings. Or sometimes you're doing it on the weekends. So we've got a lot of families who are in full-time ministry, for example, and they say, you know what? Saturday and Sunday, that's not a good weekend for us because we're pretty much, you know, on all day Saturday and Sunday. So we're going to take our weekend on Thursday and Friday. So you just have to think about the creative side of it. Don't think about school as sitting in a desk from eight to three. Think about school as what are your goals and what do you want to accomplish? And those things can be fit in between. Um, so I would say that's one, one answer. Um, the other is, I'm going to say it again, get into a community. So, you know, whatever your style is that you want, whether it's classical schooling or whether you, you know, you want uh, more of a you know, Charlotte Mason style approach or an unschooler or whatever, whatever that label is that you want um, in your schooling. There's a community of people out there and they will come alongside you. And so what we've found when we've had friends that have gone through situations where there's been extended hospitalizations of one parent, um, I've schooled for them for a period of time, right? Or they have someone step in and, and help them in that, and that, that's not a long term, but in the short term, why can't you have someone help you? Um, the other thing that I would say is part of being in a community is this thing that we call team teach. So team teach is basically there are, so we have some really good friends who homeschool with us right now. And so she tackles a couple of the subjects and I tackle a couple of the subjects. And so we're sharing the load. So if you're a single mom or you're a double working family, you can, when you're home on Saturdays, you take two subjects and teach your friends' kids those two subjects and they can work with you on, you know, teach your kids the other two subjects the other days. So that's the third point, being in community. Um, And then the fourth point is don't let just the lack of financial resources be a, a source of concern. Um, there is a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm not going to claim to be your tax advisor, but there are federal and state um, tax breaks in the state of Illinois. By law, we're considered a private school if we homeschool. And so if you think about some of the tax opportunities, your supplies and your curriculum and all that, those I'm not giving legal, legal advice or tax advice right now. But those things could be talked to your tax advisor and those things can be written off. Um, and there's a really amazing organization called um, HSLDA. It's the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. They give out grants regularly to single moms who are looking at homeschooling. Um, And so that is absolutely a way that if you can't afford the curriculum part of it. um, And then the other thing that's out there is there are um, places that you can go to to get used curriculum. And so there are used curriculum sales. And so if you're really interested in it, do some research um, online. There are libraries that you can check out some material from, Johnsburg Library here in Illinois is one that just checks out curriculum for a whole season if you needed to. Um, There are used sales that you can get the curriculum from. And then there's also places um, out in the Western suburbs that are like teacher resupply places where you could just go and get curriculum for free. Very cool. Now we did have a question come through, which uh, we can address in just a minute, but can, can you address the concern that, um, some outsiders have had looking in on the homeschooling movement. The concern, as I've heard it expressed, I've heard it expressed in different ways, but basically it boils down to this. Look, homeschooling is a process that's largely unaccountable and it's going to lead to negative effects because what you'll have is these narrow-minded parents, just um, to, to put it very bluntly, 
just transmitting all their bigotry into their kids. And now you're going to have a bunch of narrow-minded kids growing up. And that's going to lead to either narrow-minded, bigoted adults as they grow, or it's going to lead to this massive disappointment and a uh, feeling of dejection when they grow up and get wise and realize they've been lied to their whole life. Now I'm speaking very bluntly, Christine, but these are, these are, <laughs> these are the concerns that, uh, that people have about homeschooling. So you sound you know, like an advertisement for the Harvard anti-homeschooling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you see that? Did you see that? I did. <laughs> and how funny was it that they misspelled arithmetic? Uh, exactly. You know, these, these exactly. brilliant, Harvard minds and they, they, and everyone thought that they did it on purpose. Cause it's like, Oh, they're mocking homeschooling. No, no. They yeah. just, they just misspelled the word arithmetic. So sometimes I love when God, uh, uh, allows some of these critics to be hoist uh, upon their own petard a little bit, but, um, but so, so respond to the Harvard critics, yeah. Christine, yeah. what do you say? So my first point is everyone has a worldview. Like that's how we're built. Right. Everyone comes at things with a set of fundamental tenets, and those tenets are going to be either the tenets that you espouse as a parent. So, you know, for mine, mine is a biblical worldview. Other people have a secular worldview. They may have a different religious bend to their worldview. Um, but every single person that's going to be educating your kids is going to have a worldview. So absolutely, I will say unabashedly. One of my goals in educating my kids is so that they know what our worldview is, but not so that they um, not so that they are isolated, but so that they can understand their worldview and understand everyone else's worldviews. And I think that is one of the key differences. Like if you're sending your kids to public schools, they are intentionally not discussing religious worldviews, where I am intentionally discussing all worldviews. So if anyone is sheltered and biased. It's kids that are in schools where they're refusing to, to expose their kids to that. We are discussing the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Aeneid. And we're talking about the, the, you know, the Greek worldviews. We're talking about modern worldviews. We're talking about you know, the worldviews in the Scarlet Letter and the worldviews in you know, Puritan America as a whole. We're tackling all of those subjects. Whereas in a lot of modern education, whether it's public or private matter education, they are um, choosing areas not to talk about. So if anyone is sheltered, it's it's not going to be the kids that are in, in our homeschools. Love it. And I just put this comment up there from Chantal Moore. I think I can put it up without comment. She just says dead, LOL. So uh, so it, it sometimes sometimes you need to, take Harvard down a peg or two. Not that it's not a great school in many ways, but come on, Harvard, get your act together. All right. So let's, let's take a question here from Stella who says, I have a sixth grader. Is it a good time for him to start studying on his own? What do you make of that question, Christine? Yes. <laughs> so, enough said. <laughs> enough said. So studying on his own. So the goal of educating our kids is to be able to get them to be independent thinkers and to be able to allow them to be able to launch, right? That's our goal. And so right now, are you going to say to your sixth grader, okay, you know, here's your pile of books, go read them and, you know, check back with you at the end of the week and see if you're done. Maybe not, right? What you need to do right now with your sixth grader is give them what's their workload for the day. You know, in our family, what I do is I, I put little check boxes. So every single thing they have to get done, they have a little checkbox next to their list of things to do. I have them finish their checklist for the day. And then at the end of the day, we have a touch point and we say, okay, what does that look like? Um, have you completed your work for the day? Um, in terms of studying themselves, if you're talking about more like studying for a test on their own, my dad quizzed me through when I was in high school. So I'm a big proponent of families being involved in helping each other. They should study on their own. But, you know, is anyone born a good writer or, or born a good studier? You have to teach them like study skills first. So some of that is going to be you sitting alongside them and, and showing them. Like for one of my children, when one of my children studies, they write, this, they write it out over and over and over and over again because the act of writing just gets it in her brain. Whereas my other child, my second born, the act of writing itself is hard for him. Like that is, that's not his gifting. But if he were to 
hear me say the things out loud or have a sibling, you know, quiz him out loud on things, that will get it into his brain. And so everyone's going to study a little bit differently. Um, I would say, you know, give them a variety of study methods and walk alongside them and teach them how to study, but be there for them if they're one of those auditory learners that needs to hear things out loud. And if you don't have time to do that, they could easily also just speak it into, you know, speak it into a recording of themselves and listen back to it because some of them can't, you know, writing it out is not their method of learning. So think about what your kid's method of learning is. Um, and come alongside them on that. But absolutely, your goal is to launch them. And so you're, you're equipping them to be able to, to go out. Okay, so hopefully Stella found that helpful. I know I did. We, we've just got another question here um, from Chantal. She says, can you give advice on homeschooling or crisis schooling, which even homeschoolers are feeling, yeah, amen, with multiple ages. We were so used to having little, their their youngest, in daycare for two days a week, and now he dominates our learning time. Christine, help out Chantal with this, please. Oh man, Chantal, I feel your pain. So our youngest, Caleb, we were used to having him in preschool outside the house at least a couple hours a day, several days a week. We did that because I knew that I needed that focus time. And my preschooler is the most amazing, most loving little boy who absolutely is the Tasmanian devil who comes into our schoolroom and, you know, stirs everything up and, and breaks everything. And, you know, the, the whole focus becomes on him. So here's what we do. Um, and this is something that we've been working on because it is not by, it's not by far solved. Um, we, as part of their schooling tasks, we assign a kid to Caleb. So sometimes it is Christine's time, but if I'm working on honors geometry with Lauren, then it might be Naomi's time. And so I say, Naomi, this week, Caleb is working on his colors. Here's, you know, it requires a little bit of prep. So here's a box of things he hasn't touched in a while that's gonna help him with his colors. You're gonna go downstairs to the kitchen table and you've got the next 45 minutes work through these things with him. Okay. So 45 minutes is done. We're done with Naomi time. She gets back to her studies and now it's going to be Miriam time. And so Miriam in her time with Caleb, she's going to go downstairs and she's going to work on memory matching with him. And she's going to do sand with him. And so we're varying up the tasks. And so basically I kind of think a little bit ahead of time and mind you girl, like it is, you know, five minutes ahead of time sometimes because it's like, Oh, he's done with that already. I've got to do the next thing. Um, so our crisis schooling has been involving Miriam and Naomi and Joshua and Lauren and giving them assigned times. And when that doesn't work, there's the trampoline in the backyard. And Caleb can go out in the backyard with one of the siblings and just burn off some steam. And then there's nap time. Because nap time is one of the most glorious times of the day. So Amen. Amen. assign a kid because they absolutely have a role in this. And remember when I said before, like, Part of what you're finding is that when you're homeschooling, your kids have more time than they had in public schools. So they have a little bit of margin. And so here's the other like joy of that. What I've seen is that that's actually growing their relationships. It's growing their empathy for each other because before when Caleb was just being Caleb, Tasmanian devil, we were all screaming at him, Caleb, put that down, stop doing that. So if we give him something else to do, now all of a sudden they're playing with Caleb and they're enjoying him a little bit more. And so that's that's kind of how we tackle it a little bit. I recruit my kids to be mini teachers. Super duper helpful. And it's so great when they get to that age where they can start to do that, isn't it? Yes. Miriam's seven. She just turned seven. So she's she was doing it at six. So amazing. Wow. Well, um, we need to wrap up, Christine, but what do you see? What do you foresee in the future? for Veritas Academy? What do I foresee for Veritas? We are loving the Lord and God is bringing us people all the time that are um, meeting the needs that we, that, you know, we have. So God willing, um, Veritas Academy is going to continue in the way we've been going. If the governor decides that we are going to need to do the same e-learning as everyone else, what we're doing is equipping parents so that they don't have to do reactionary schooling at home. 
So we have regular meeting times electronically, um, but every parent gets uh, a syllabus for the year and daily schedules and daily checklists. So they are already organized, hopefully. They already have their stuff together and they can start. And in the future, like as soon as things open back up again, God willing, we're going to be continuing through the high school years. In two years, we should have our first high school graduates. Awesome. How can folks find out more about Veritas Academy? So Veritas themselves, I would say um, you can go to our website. So it's veritasacademychicago.com. You can take a look at that and scroll through who we are. Um, if you're just interested in general in saying like, what is homeschooling outside of Veritas? I would say go to hslda.org um, forward slash get dash started. And that'll just give you a, an overview of like, what is homeschool? Is it right for me? And what are some steps to homeschool? And they've got a whole bunch of other, they've got a link on there too. If you search for homeschooling organizations in your area, if you're listening like outside of Chicago right now, and you're just saying, well, that's great. Veritas is in Chicago. That doesn't help me. They've got a list of organizations by city within the whole country. So you can take a look at what that looks like and um, just explore it. Excellent. Well, Christine, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I, I know I found it incredibly helpful and I know our listeners are going to as well. Uh, for those listening, if you're new to the Think Institute, let me just encourage you to subscribe to us on YouTube. You can like the Think Institute on Facebook for more excellent content. Um, and I want to remind you too that every day of the week, we are going to be rolling out a new episode. Some of them are going to be one minute long. Some of them are going to be five minutes long because you don't need a lot of time to create good quality content. At least that is our goal. But we want to put tools and tips in your hands to help you live out your piece of the Great Commission and get equipped, engaged, and encouraged to explain, share, and defend the Christian message. So follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We are at the Think Institute. On Twitter, it's at Think Inst. And again, if you like this, please share this video. Be sure to pass it along to someone you think will benefit from it as well. And you know what? This is not goodbye. This has just been a little pit stop along the way of your spiritual journey. And I truly hope that you've heard something today that you'll be able to put into practice over this next week. And that's all we have for you today. So until next time, I hope it made you think.